Since 2017, the Somewhere in the Skies podcast has been a place for people in all walks of life to tell their personal UFO stories. How have these sightings and encounters changed those who experience them? From Beyond the Fray Publishing comes Ryan Sprague's brand new book, Stories from Somewhere in the Skies. This compendium brings to life some of the most powerful UFO stories ever submitted to Somewhere in the Skies podcast. It takes us on a fascinating journey through life-altering experiences from those who stared into the skies and had something extraordinary stare back. Stories from Somewhere in the Skies, now available in paperback and ebook on Amazon. Order today from the link in the show notes or visit Amazon and search for Stories from Somewhere in the Skies. You've reached the Somewhere in the Skies podcast. Please leave your message at the beep. I, I freaking love the show. The UFO subject kind of dropped off my radar for a little bit, and Somewhere in the Skies has definitely rekindled my my fascination and love for the subject. So thank you again for that. And I will be listening as long as you're making a show. Hey, man, thanks for thanks for taking the time and hearing me out. I really appreciate it. You have a good one, all right? This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Hey Ryan, this is Jazz. Um, you and the listeners may already know me because well, I've been on your show and from UFO Twitter and whatnot. And I had promised you I would call in and uh, do one of the uh, witness account stories from my own experiences. So this is it. I should start by saying I'm well into my 60s now. And I've always been interested in the topic of UFOs, but mostly like from a science fiction thing or just, you know, speculation. I never saw anything for more than 60 years except for, you know, every once in a while, maybe some weird lights in the sky, but who knows what those are. And that was until November of 2020 when everything changed. Um, it was... Uh, pretty late in the evening for me anyway it was, it was like nine o'clock it was well after dark and I had gone out on my front porch and I just happened to I wasn't looking for anything in particular I just happened to look to the east because my house faces east and above the ridge to the east of our house I saw a thing it wasn't a, a dot of light or a satellite I mean it was a it was around it was round like a like a globe or a orb or whatever you want to call it and depending how far away it is it had to have been fairly good size I guess but it was up there above the ridge and it had all these different lights I mean it, it wasn't like regular FAA lights on on a plane or a helicopter or anything um, lots of different colors and they and they seem to keep shifting um, I immediately yelled for my wife. She came out and, and looked at it, and she was pretty amazed, but also had no clue what it might be. Um, and after I called her out, I ran across the street to get away from the streetlights, and I started filming it, because it was moving, it, but it was moving really slowly. It was going, like, from left to right. That would be north to south, um, but back and forth slowly, and it, and it would go up and down, and it just kept doing that. I filmed that thing for more than five minutes. It's on, it's on my YouTube channel. Uh, but really, that's that's the whole account. It never came close. It never did anything dramatic. It didn't explain, it, you know, exhibit any burst of speed or or anything like that. It was just sort of going back and forth. And I, I eventually gave up and I went inside and went to bed. Um, so that was that. 
and it was nothing really definitive. It was barely a week later that the second one happened. I was out on the back deck behind my house, and my wife was walking the dog on the side street next to us. And I suddenly saw her looking up, and she was pointing, and she was taking out her camera. And so I looked up, and I should say this was, again, it was pretty late, about the same time of night. And it was, but it was a dark night. It had been raining on and off, and it was mostly overcast. And going right over our neighborhood, part of it right over our house, there was a black triangle. Um, that's the term everybody uses and is familiar with. And it it was big. I don't know how big, because I don't know how high up it was, but there were rain clouds and they get down pretty low and it was lower than that so it wasn't super high up um it didn't have the typical lights that you see like in a lot of the artwork or in the ufo documentaries and stuff it, it didn't have the um like the three a light at each corner or a bright light in the center what it did have was a whole bunch of these little tiny sparkly lights of different colors and they seemed to shift and they moved in relation to each other like they weren't really attached to whatever it was and it, it was just kind of mystifying and I was just awestruck just kind of watching because it's just this huge thing like I, I like I said I, I I got the impression depending on how high up it was that it it should have been like the size of a football field I mean it was big and it didn't make any noise and it just was going over and it just kept going and much like the last one it never did anything extraordinary it, it didn't suddenly speed away or should it just kept going and it was an overcast night until it just faded out of sight and I was checking local news and you know for a few days see if anybody had else had seen this or reported it and nobody had but uh if 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 you hadn't have been out there on a somewhat rainy night and staring up at the clouds you wouldn't have seen it so i guess that kind of makes sense so that was the second one and there was two within one week and then we didn't see anything until uh late spring of the next year in 2021 and it was the middle of the afternoon i was out on my back deck and by that time i was following your advice and i was always whenever i had time like looking up at the sky and then something came by <laughs> that i'd never seen before and it came from the east heading west or no from the west heading east from my left to my right not too far away from our house and it was, for lack of a better term, what everybody calls today a tic-tac. There's just no other way to put it. Um, it was much longer than it was around. It was white. I guesstimated it was probably like the size of a bus. It might have been like 40, 50 feet, but again, it depends how high it was. It's hard to say. No sound. And it took me a moment to realize that that's what I was looking at, that it wasn't a plane or something. And I reached for my phone and realized it wasn't in my pocket. It was charging inside. And I just went crashing into my house. I went crashing through the house and yelling for my wife, get out front, get your phone. And I went and yanked mine off the charger and went out front. And my wife got out in front of me. And when I got out there, there was nothing there. And she said she saw something white, but just for a second. And then she lost it. So we weren't sure what happened but um, I had gotten a good look at it while it was moving. It was not really going that fast. And again, totally quiet and everything. And that was the end of that encounter. That was the first of three that were all the same type of vehicle or the same one. Maybe I live on an inner space hyperpass or something. Uh, the next one came during the summer. Uh, it was again in broad daylight. It was in the morning, uh, late morning. And it was pretty much a repeat it was another white tic tac thing no windows no tail no wings no it was just i mean it could have been a huge long skinny propane cylinder or something you know for for whatever that that's worth but this time i had my phone with me 
And once I realized, once again, what it was, I brought up my camera and started filming, trying to. And this time, it came by, and it got just about even with my house. And at that point, it stopped. And I, to my memory, and what little there is on the video, because the camera refused to focus on the damn thing, it was trying to focus on everything else, like the phone lines and whatnot. Um, it was going, and then it just wasn't going, and it was just hanging there. And again, no sound or anything. Pretty much the same as the last one. But it stopped, and it started to turn. It started to rotate a little bit. So one end, the nose or the tail, whichever it might be, was pointing a little more towards me instead of being like parallel. And it was there just for a second or two, and it vanished. And and when I say it vanished, I, I told you this before, I don't mean it didn't fly away, it didn't land, it didn't crash. Um, it was just there. And then if you look at the video, and a friend of mine who's a videographer did some enhancements on it and uh, color corrections to make, make things pop out a little more. It was there, and then on the next frame, it just wasn't there anymore. It, it just disappeared. So there was that one, and then um, later that year, and I didn't get that one on film, and it happened faster. Uh, it was, again, a repeat. This one was in the afternoon again. And another one of them came by, but it just kept on going. And so it didn't do anything as spectacular, although that's my memory's not good for that one and I, and I wish I'd gotten it on film it feels like it flew away but it was there and then I couldn't see it anymore but so I'm not sure what that one did the, so the second of the two was really the most spectacular one for me and there's been nothing since then we haven't seen anything else that might qualify as a craft um, I know you like people to talk about how it made them feel and whatnot um that's kind of hard to say. Uh, the, the first one, the glowing orb thing above the ridge, I really only just felt confused, I think, and I was questioning myself immediately thereafter, like, well, maybe could it have been a helicopter with some really not legal FAA lighting for some bizarre light show? I, I still don't know to this day. Maybe. Uh, I think the triangle is the one that really changed everything for both me and my wife. Uh, because that was, I just just nothing that explains that, and and it was shocking. I I felt a sense of awe. I no, I don't recall feeling anything like f being frightened, but I it was more just being amazed. And the the Tic Tacs were a totally different thing, particularly the the second one that that disappeared. I I felt in some ways, again, kind of just awestruck, like my view of the world had changed something that should have been fictional or hypothetical or something that happened to other people, and then it's right there in broad daylight in front of your eyes. Um, I like Unlike some people, I, I never considered it like a religious experience. It just made me more confident that we don't know everything that's going on. If, if what that particularly the Tic Tacs, if what those things can do, if, that, if that's human tech, then I'm going to be really annoyed at who hasn't shared that tech with the rest of the world because I don't see any other explanation for that except any gravity. And if somebody's figured that out and not told us, they got some explaining to do, as I've said to many people. Um, it, it's left me more open to other things. I, I think the experiences made me more ready to listen to other people Whereas in the past, I would have been like, really? Um, okay, maybe, but, you know, it's, I guess, and confusion's another word that I would use. Um, I, I remain confused about it. As far as whether or not I have any theories of what it is, I, I already started to run down that. Um, I think the first one, it's, it's possible that might have been something like a helicopter with something really weird. The other ones, no. Um, I, I've never seen a being or anything like that, just things that show up in the sky. Um, I tend to think 
to this day still the most likely explanation is that it's something non-human i i hope we in a way we don't have that tech and and it's being hidden from us but if something is coming from i don't know another solar system or some people say time travelers i guess you know or interdimensional which i don't really understand multi-dimensional stuff i guess that's all possible and i'm not smart enough to figure that out but it's real and i experienced it five times and it's really changed things for both me and my wife you know we we look at the world in a different way we talk thing about things more seriously that we might have maybe laughed off at, at some point but uh yeah that's about it if anybody wants to get a hold of me i'm jay shaw on twitter uh you i'll send you a link to our videos they're they're really not very good um but yeah that's it and nothing since then kind of disappointing i i keep watching keep hoping so thanks for letting everybody share their stories thanks for sharing mine and it would be archived somewhere and uh everybody keep enjoying the show Hey Ryan, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Maxwell Stoner, and today I'm going to be telling you guys about me and Chris's UFO experience. Um, some of you guys might know us from the monthly booth that we set up at our local art walk, where we just kind of educate and inform the public about the post-2017 UFO, UAP revolution or whatever. And um, not a lot of you guys might know how we got into this and why we do this and I'm going to be sharing me and Chris's human initiated contact experience um, me and Chris had gotten slowly interested in UFOs um, in 2020 like a lot of other people uh, we started watching interviews we started watching documentaries um, we lived together with roommates so we're watching all these documentaries and one day we ended up watching kind of an infamous documentary and some of you guys might know um, where I'm going with this but we watched a documentary that puts forth an idea that humans can initiate contact with non-human intelligences whatever aliens and UFOs so me and Chris watch this documentary and we both think it, it's kind of so far out there and so unbelievable. Um, like so many UFO documentaries are, it seemed like they made up a ton of stuff. And anyways, we, within the week, I think we had decided that we would go on our back balcony. We we're going to set a 10 minute timer and we were going to meditate for aliens for peaceful contact, close encounters of the fifth kind, whatever. Um, we set a 10 minute timer, meditate, timer goes off. Within two seconds of us turning off the timer and looking in the sky, Chris says, what is that? And we look and it's it looks like a big, shining star is kind of floating around in the sky and we both didn't know what we were looking at we we're trying to figure out you know what it was and it honestly it looked somewhat like um a chinese lantern would and it's what i think some of you guys might be thinking but um we watched this thing for a second and that's when it was kind of moving behind the clouds and whenever it went behind the clouds, we could tell that it was something really strange, not something we were used to seeing. And we had started sky watching a lot. And um, when we saw this thing go behind the clouds, it lost all of its kind of shining rays. So it looked like a perfect hot, white hot sphere that was behind the clouds shining very very brightly and, and then it stops 
We're just seeing this white hot kind of orangey orb and it starts to shrink shrink and it just shrinks out of existence right as we're watching it and honestly that night we didn't think much of it it was it wasn't super impactful this the second that it happened um it wasn't till you know weeks later that we would really um you know kind of digest what we were seeing and how we came to see that how we we really set a time and a timer timer goes off and we look up and there it is and that's really what happened um even to this day it continues to kind of set in on you know what this means if if we really made contact uh with a non-human intelligence then you know that's that's pretty awesome it's pretty cool but we didn't know we don't know we don't know what it was to this day we don't know you know some people say that we just manifested it or whatever and i can't argue with that necessarily because you know we went out to go see a ufo and we just saw one and it definitely has impacted us um in a handful of ways obviously we do this booth now where we just kind of um tell the public about the most recent uap ufo happenings in the government and we stay i mean we say conspiracy th- free on our booth um but honestly our our contact experience was very strange and it has impacted us and i think i can speak for both of us when i say it's impacted us spiritually as well and it's been i think a lot of i think a lot of people could have interpreted this as you know a real religious experience or you know i think in the past people would have said you know it was an angel in the sky um but we don't know and We still don't know. But um, thanks for listening. And that's pretty much it. Hey guys, Ryan here. When I'm not making the Somewhere in the Skies podcast, I am listening to podcasts. And one of my favorites since the very beginning has and continues to be the Paranormal Podcast with Jim Harrell. Do you like conversations about UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, and the unexplained? The Paranormal Podcast, which launched in 2005, is the longest-running podcast of its type on the internet. The show harkens back to the best of paranormal media over the years. Shows like In Search Of and Unsolved Mysteries. My favorite aspect of the show is that every week, it's something completely different. Which, for someone who lives, breathes, and sleeps UFOs, it's so refreshing to learn about other mysterious topics as well. But don't get me wrong, Jim's interviews on the UFO topic are also top-notch. Whether you're a veteran UFO researcher or brand new to the topic, Jim's interviews always set the standard for objective and insightful conversations. He's interviewed everyone from Jacques Vallée to the late, great Stanton Friedman. And that is just the start. And for you superstitious listeners out there, I have been honored to be a guest on the Paranormal Podcast a whopping 13 times. Luckily, I'll be coming back on soon to change that number. So please, do me a personal favor and tune in to the Paranormal Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to Somewhere in the Skies. My name is Sally, and I am 60 years old. I have worked in administration at a global manufacturing company for 31 years. I come from a middle-class family where my father was an Air Force veteran, fireman, and government official his whole life. When I was a teenager, I hung out with my friends quite a bit to listen to music and do what teenagers do, what most 16-year-olds did in the late 70s. 
One night I got off of work at dusk from the local KFC and my friend Cindy met me there. We were to be at our friend Tom's house in about a half an hour. Neither one of us had a car, so we had to walk the mile or so. When we were about two blocks from Tom's house, we saw a large red orb with two smaller red orbs behind it. They were moving fast right above us and they were descending at a sharp angle. Just then they disappeared, but the city tornado alarms went off. There was no weather threat, so we could not imagine what had happened. While we were rounding the corner to Tom's house, we saw like two people coming towards us at the other end of the block, and they looked like they were wearing beekeeper or chemical suits of some kind. So we ran to Tom's and pounded on the door, screaming to let us in. Cindy and I were too scared to look out the door or window to see what happened to the strange beekeeper people. To this day, when we talk, we still wonder what the heck that was all about. I do need to add that we had not imbibed any substances that day. We were pretty sober. One time, my friend Lori was sitting in a car with our friend Greg on an afternoon eating takeout. They were parked facing the river, which was perpendicular to the car. All at once, a cylind cylindrical shape, like, like the Tic Tac or recent type of thing that's out now. It shot past them just above the river. The craft had no wings or means of propulsion, made no sound, and had no markings. Just when they recovered their composure about it, it shot back in the other direction. There were too many trees and bushes around the banks of the river so they could not see past their viewpoint. To this day, she still ponders that rare event. I wish I could have seen it too. Lori is a very sane, sober, and bookish person. She's not prone to fantasy, and she's been my best friend for 45 years, so I believe her. A couple years later, we had a UFO sighting on the 4th of July. It was about 1993. I took my daughter with me, who was four at the time, and Lori to the local park to watch the fireworks. It was still fairly light out, so we spread out a blanket on the grass to mark our spot. I was laying down looking up at the sky when I spotted a craft that was stationary. It was round and silver looking, kind of like a ball bearing, just hanging there and not moving. Lori saw it too, but she wasn't mystified like I was. I estimated there were about 20 minutes had elapsed and it was still there. It got dark out, so it might have still been there or it could have disappeared. But I was just pondering that Perhaps the occupants of the orb were just there to see the fireworks. And I saw that same orb or a similar one in Mesa, Arizona, just a few years ago. I did snap a picture of it from a distance. So that's just a couple of my stories. Thank you. Hi, Ryan, and hi, listeners. So my name is Persephone. Persephone May Holloway on Instagram if you want to come find me. And I'm an alternative and indie musician who has been an experiencer her whole life. But to be honest, I avoided even talking about this stuff and maybe even believing in it for a very long time. I had what you'd probably call an aversion to it, whether that was planned or by accident, who knows. But it wasn't until this year when I started having some really strange dreams and then talking to some people about it that I decided I should probably go to hypnotherapy. And this is the story that I uncovered from that. It was an unseasonably hot day in September 1997 in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I lived in a quiet suburban neighborhood known for its rich history with the Revolutionary and Civil War. My neighborhood was not unacquainted with high strangeness, but I didn't know that. I just assumed I was the only one, as most kids do. That day was different. Normally my bus driver would drive past the one-way wooded median to the back cul-de-sac where I lived, drop me off, and then drive back out the neighborhood on the other side of the median. For whatever reason today, he dropped me off at the stony sign at the front entrance. I looked at him and in probably in that annoying, precocious child way said, This isn't my stop. He said, Well, it is today. It was a bright blue sky. 
with puffy white cumulus clouds everywhere. It should have only been a 10 minute walk home. When I crossed over to the median in the wooded area, it was really overgrown back then, and the houses were all set a little bit back from the street, probably to give more privacy. This time was different. It was completely still. There was nothing, no birds, no sounds of the trees. The only thing I could hear was the sound of my shoes on the asphalt and the crunch of the fall leaves under my feet. There should be something, I thought to myself. We were in a neighborhood full of young families and other children, and it was right after school. There should be other kids playing. Almost as soon as the thought crossed my mind, I heard children playing Ring Around the Rosie. But the sound didn't come from any particular direction. It was almost as if I just heard it inside my head and nowhere else. I don't know why, but the only thought that crossed my mind was, those aren't children, those aren't human. I began to bolt to run as fast as I could. The way that I used to remember the story, I was suddenly at my front door running up to it, pounding for my mother to let me in. When she didn't answer, I collapsed down and the door opened by itself and she came out. She looked at me, not distressed despite the disheveled appearance that I had, and she said, where have you been? You're 45 minutes late. I told everyone that story for years and I never knew what happened during those 45 minutes or how I had suddenly appeared from one place in my neighborhood to another. And it wasn't until this year when I went to hypnotherapy with a friend and started to uncover what I couldn't remember that I remembered the missing details in between. As soon as I had the thought, they're not human, and I began to run for it, I had the sensation that something was above me, bearing down on me. I felt paralyzed, frozen, like I couldn't move. And next thing I felt like I was up in the air, like the moment you go over a roller coaster, but the inertia never hit. Just one moment I was on the ground and the next I thought, I'm in the air. And then I blacked out. When I woke, I was lying on some kind of padded table, the bright light in my face, not unlike what happens when you go to a doctor's office. There were small, what I thought at first were children around me moving, like medical assistants doing various tasks, but they weren't children. They were gray-skinned, bald-headed, huge black almond-shaped eyes, almost no nose and a thin mouth. I turned my head to the left and saw a man in his maybe 40s, graying hair, and he was naked. I was only nine and embarrassed to see it, so I turned away immediately so I wouldn't look at him anymore. A very tall being approached. Seven, eight feet tall, maybe. It definitely wasn't human. For years, my mind put the image in my head of someone wearing a boxy astronaut suit and a mirrored helmet because I don't think I could handle what I'd seen. And again, it wasn't until hypnotherapy that it made it clear for me. This being had a head like that of an insect of some kind, huge eyes, not unlike what some people would call a praying mantis, but the coloration was wrong, darker not like the bright green I was used to seeing in my North American upbringing. When it spoke, it didn't use a mouth or anything like that. I just heard the voice in my head. It just said, be still. It held a metal instrument of some kind up to my nose and I felt a sharp pain far up. I wanted to cry, but I wasn't given much of a chance to. Another of the small beings reached up behind my neck and touched a mole there. It's still there to this day. I don't know what they were checking or looking for. It nodded to the larger being. It nodded back and then said, we're done here, take her. They shuffled me off the table into another side of this room. This room was huge, busy. I got the impression that everyone had a function or a purpose. Something was happening everywhere, but there were partitions and I couldn't see. I could sense that there were other people other than myself. I could sense that people were upset, distressed, but mostly just out of it, like they were half asleep. There were multiple floors above this room almost like standing in the mezzanine of an office building. It's because of that I started calling this room the mezzanine, although I don't really know why. They led me to dress back into part of my school uniform, although they didn't give me back my shoes, backpack, or blazer, though those things would be on me when I ended up back at my house later. They took me to the mouth of a hallway where a man waited for me, or at least he looked like a man, but I knew he wasn't human. From the minute I saw him, I knew he knew everything about me as if he'd looked inside me and read every moment of my soul, my dreams, my fears, everything. He knew it all. 
He was about six foot two, dark, short cropped hair, bright blue eyes, so blue. At the time, I compared it to my mother's favorite actor, Richard Harris, but even then they glowed with a kind of luminosity that I can't explain. He seemed annoyed at me, and he grabbed my arm with slender, pale hands and began to pull me along. He wore some kind of molded black jumpsuit with no seams, zippers, or buttons that I could see anyway, and something like maybe a cape or a robe I can't quite remember, but I just got the impression that he was important. He seemed annoyed, and I thought he was annoyed at me, but in hindsight and through, again, hypnotherapy, we think perhaps he was annoyed at the mantid being behind us that I started calling the mentor. Why, I don't know. It was just the name I gave it. He took me to an area where there was a sunken room, much like in American-style ranch houses, how you have sunken living rooms that are a few steps down. It was padded, and there was a huge bay window in there, but it was shuttered closed, so I never saw outside of it. In the center of the room sat five beings with an opening right at the front, as if you're meant to join the circle. They sat lotus-style, and while they were built similarly to the other gray beings, these ones had no face. They were following the track of some sort of object. It was like a thousand tiny metal pieces. I keep thinking of it as kinetic metal because it would shift and change in the air, but it was all painted blue. They followed it as one, all turning to watch it. They frightened me for some reason, but with one look and an order to be silent, look, and pay attention, the fear left me. The being tried to explain to me the purpose of this game. But it was almost like he put an entire zip file inside my head. I couldn't comprehend it. He seemed frustrated at this, now actually at me. There was a gray being beside him. She stepped up. I got the impression she was a she. Matronly, kind. She touched his arm and said, Axilia. I still don't know what it means, whether it's a title or another part of his name or something. He paused, let her come forward. She explained it to me, but I don't remember her ever using words. But however she explained it, I suddenly understood. I sat down with the others. The purpose of this game was to keep the ball, as it was a ball, in the shape of a sphere, and pass it from one to the other with a slight telepathic, what I call, knock. You would have to wait for the other person to take it. If you let go of the control too soon, it would shatter into a thousand pieces. I finally started to get the hang of it. And I got the sense, rather than the words, that being behind me was very pleased. So I turned to look at him, and I saw that he was smiling, mouth closed, of course, but smiling. Something about this handsome man proud of me and watching the game made my pre-adolescent heart skip a beat. The moment that that happened, as if he sensed it immediately, his attention snapped from the game to me. I got the briefest flash of something like I wasn't supposed to know. Something like, people don't look at me like that, or humans. And also, that isn't my function. Although, I swear it was like he was telling someone else that, and not me. And then it was like that all went away, shuttered closed, much like the window. I couldn't read his thoughts at all. Silence, and I thought he was mad, or that I'd done something wrong. Then very slowly, calculatingly, he asked, do you find me attractive? I said yes. I dropped the ball behind me, unable to control it anymore, and it shattered again into a thousand pieces. Someday, I will be much more to you. But for now, I'm just your friend, he said. Something about this filled me with relief. I was only nine, after all, and he was an adult, so it was scary. There is bits and pieces of missing time here that I'm unsure I'll recover. And we ended up on some kind of flight deck. There was a chair, a leather chair in the middle, black leather, with crystal half-moon arms around them, or perhaps glass, but something told me it was more than glass. Golden embossed symbols that I couldn't read just slightly above them. He was trying to explain to me how they worked in the case that I could fly someday. And I was telling him that I have astigmatism, I'll never fly. And he laughed. He laughed. He thought that was so funny, and I didn't know why he laughed. He seemed like he was about to explain it to me, but the door opened, and the insectoid being came back in and said, What are you doing? We're wasting time. We have to put her back. He approached with a syringe full of yellow liquid, and I backed up, scared. And next thing I knew, 
the needle was in my neck, and everything went black. When I woke back up, I was running towards my front door again, with no memory of everything that had just happened, and there was a reddish mist filling the sky, or a light. It's still strange that my mother never reacted to it. And the only reason I remembered the story was because for years I would take friends back to that old neighborhood and say, hey, you should hear some of the crazy stories that happened here. There are more details and a lot more to the story before this and after. And I have reason to believe that the being is still in touch with me in very lucid dreams. But that's a story for another time. Personally, I don't feel that I had a really negative experience here on... I don't consider myself an abductee. Um, I don't like that word because it makes me feel like I'm supposed to be a victim. Um, I really see myself as more of an experiencer and I'm someone who this has changed my life for the better. I just don't know how yet. Um, and it's something that I'm meant to talk about and share. And that's just how I feel. In the meantime, Thank you for listening, and just know if you've ever experienced anything like this, you're not alone. There are others like you out there. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network.